Hallelujah, hallelujah. The, the anointing in this house today is a wrecking ball in the kingdom of darkness. And I'm telling you by the Spirit, we are, we are beginning to see things that we have never seen before. And I just declare the name of the Lord that the spirit of breakthrough is upon us. Hallelujah, hallelujah. As the apostle, the prophet, and the pastor of this house, I command every demon spirit that's in this building that's been on your life in the name of the Lord. I curse you in the name of Jesus. And I declare that today you are set free by the power of the Lord. That while you are here in the house of God, I send the angels of the Lord into your homes, onto your property right now in the name of Jesus. That every hindering demon spirit, every devouring demon spirit of hell that's come against you in this sanctuary in the name of the Lord, we break in the name name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We're not a normal house. We are an unusual. Hallelujah. Peter said we are a peculiar people. While you're standing, we're just going to go to the word of the Lord. Uh, if you want to put it on the screen, we're going to be reading out of 2 Timothy 3.16. I'm going to read Matthew 24, verse 35. And I'm going to read out of Isaiah 55 and 11. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. All scripture. Not some. All scripture. From the first verse of Genesis to the last verse of Revelation. All scripture has been given by the inspiration. The word inspiration means God breathed. That's what it reads in the original. All scripture has been God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness. That the man of God or the woman of God may be perfect or mature and thoroughly furnished. That means you will have everything that you need for every good work. Matthew 24. This is the chapter that Jesus is explaining about the end times and what's getting ready to take place. So it is very applicable to the posture that we as a church are in right now. Matthew chapter 24 and verse, um, let's start with verse 34. Verily, verily, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word, my words shall not. When we talk about somebody dying, what do we say they did? They passed away. So the Lord is saying, the earth and the heavens will die before the words that God has spoken will ever die. One more verse out of Isaiah chapter 55. Starting with verse 10 and 11. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and makes it the earth doesn't have any choice. Makes it bring forth and bud. Why? That it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. This is our key verse here. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return. Unto me, unfulfilled, empty, void, 
dead, which I please, but it shall accomplish that which I please. Now, not only will it accomplish it, but it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Now, Lord, we thank you for thy word today. God, that today, Lord, we're going to make the devil tremble as I release the word of the Lord under the unction of the Holy Ghost and the anointing of God that is in this building. We declare that strongholds are crumbling right now in the atmosphere and that the word of the Lord will be sent out as a clarion call unto thy people to believe that you have declared it and it shall be done in the name of Jesus. You may be seated. The title of my message today would be It Is Written. Hallelujah. Just because you outlaw the Bible or burn it doesn't mean it's not going to come to pass. One verse says this about prophecy, that holy men of old were moved on by the Holy Ghost to speak the words of the Lord. There are in the atmosphere right now, if you could see it, God has got me in a place right now where I'm really feeling the need that we have to come into another dimension of the spirit realm. The reason most believers walk in defeat is because the spiritual things of God cannot be discerned or understood by the natural man. And if you are trying to lay hold on God through your natural mind, you will be an abject failure because you have to step over into the realm of the Spirit. For only the Holy Spirit discerns the things of the Spirit. May God right now anoint your minds in the name of the Lord. I'm curses off of you in the name of the Lord. We're breaking generational declarations off of you in the name of the Lord. You are healed right now in the name of Jesus. The devourer is broken off you right now in the name of Jesus. Why? Because it is written. It is written. It is written. And it will not return unto me void. So I loose it as an arrow of deliverance into the sanctuary unto those that are under the sound of my voice around the world. The anointing of God is breaking the yokes off of you in Jesus' name. There are some absolutes that are going to happen that the enemy cannot stop. Because God said, if I write it, it cannot be returned unto me void. First that we know of God is that he first spoke the word. In the beginning was the Word. The earth was without form and void. Darkness is on the face of the deep. What happens? God steps on the edge of nothing and he begins to speak the Word. When the Word was spoken, there was a shift in the atmosphere. Darkness lost its grip on what it had owned for eons of time. 
And the word of God being spoken, hallelujah, begin to cause an alignment of what the enemy had ruled over. Could it be that there has not been the victories that we have desired to see in the United States of America? It's because we have not had the faith to believe it. God says this, do what I did and say what I said. You will never walk in faith until you believe that what God has said is an irrevocable decree that cannot be repealed, cannot be blotted out, cannot be changed by the laws of men or the courts of men. But there is a higher court that is ruling supremely in the atmosphere today over the powers of darkness. God said it. Then he demonstrated it. And then he wrote it. This is why everything is about the word. When God was coming back to create a new creation, the word was made flesh. Then the word, hallelujah, redeemed us. I believe it's Colossians that says that the worlds have been framed by the word of God. The New Testament is almost a repetition of the Old Testament. Apostle Paul and Peter and the writers most of their writings, they are quoting what was declared in the old creation before the blood of the Lamb was slain. But Calvary took the blood and gave power to the declarative word of the Lord. There is life in the blood. We sing about it today. You cannot kill us. Hallelujah. I am a wrecking ball in the Holy Ghost that's going to come through the powers of darkness. There has to be an assurance that where you stand in God, that the powers and the anointing that is in you is greater than the anointing of the enemy's world. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You must stand on the word of God because it is is written. Jesus declared through by demonstration that when it has been written in the book, and I believe the Holy Ghost wrote this book, Jesus was the Word made flesh. But he said, I'm going away, and the Spirit of truth will come, and he will bring back to your remembrance whatsoever things I have spoken to you. And I believe that this is why out of all of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that the Father and the Son, according to the Bible, are resting in heaven right now. And the only part of God that's in the earth that is working is the Holy Ghost, making intercession for us. But part of that is he is protecting what has been written by the word of God in the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And so when Jesus is getting ready, he has now been anointed, hallelujah, by the Spirit of God. Every time anointing comes into the equation, the word is challenged. The enemy will never persecute a church that he's not afraid of. Anytime the enemy comes after you, it is a sure sign that you are a troublesome to him and that he is worried. 
No wonder the enemies tried to keep us homeless uh, and shift from one place to the next uh, and release all kinds of things against us. But we are still standing by the power of God. Why? Because of the prophetic word of the Lord uh, that has been released in the atmosphere over us. Uh, freedom today in the name of Jesus. Uh, that this day may you leave changed uh, forever by the power of God. Uh, may the wealth of the wicked be released to you right now in the name of Jesus. Uh, may God take his iron hand uh, and break the chains of darkness uh, that are ruling over your life, over your business, over your home, over your mortgage. Uh, may there be a cancellation uh, that is declared out of heaven over you uh, that you are set free by the power of God uh, for where the spirit of the Lord is, uh, there is liberty. Hallelujah. What do you do when the enemy catches you by yourself? What do you do when he isolates you and there is no intercessor to stand with you? What do you do when you're alone? You do what Jesus did. The Spirit led him into the wilderness. One word says he was driven into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. This confrontation was not about assessing Jesus and his anointing. This confrontation was about letting the devil know that there is somebody on the earth that you have no control over. Up until this point, the enemy had triumphed almost every human being in some form or manner. They had tripped up and made some mistake. But here is the word made flesh standing in the wilderness. And the enemy comes after him with everything that he's got. And he says, I know you're hungry. You hadn't eaten for 40 days. You have in you the ability to turn a rock into bread. What did Jesus do? He said, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone. What was he declaring? Now, devil, you think that my substance and my energy would come from turning a rock into bread and eating it. But I don't live by natural food. My sustaining strength is by the bread of life. And I am the bread of life. The devil's head is swirling says, well, you're the son of God. Why don't you jump off this high spot? Let's see what you're made of. Jesus looked at him and said, it is written. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Hallelujah. Something being released to the atmosphere right now by the Spirit of the Lord. What is happening? I am loosing the Word of God. It is written. It is written. It is written that you are not captives, but you are free. For the Spirit of the Lord is liberty. This last one was to make Jesus doubt his pedigree. His anointing, his identity. That's what's happening to the church right now. It's not just in the natural that there is an identity crisis. That men and women don't know if they're a man or they're a woman. You realize how much darkness it takes to loose. And it's very interesting that this is really not a global problem. This is a United States of America problem. It might be to some degree in Europe, but there is an identity crisis in this nation that people don't know who they are. And the enemy's coming and saying, I know you think you're a man, but you're really a woman. Or they're coming to a woman, I think, that you know you are a woman, but you're really a man, and there's this confusion. 
But there's also an identity crisis in the church. We don't know who we are. Are we Pentecostal? Are we a group that meets just to be on a social level? Are we here to just be a bridge between ideologies that have clashed together? I got news for you. We are the body of Christ. I have no identity crisis today who we are. I know who we are. We are many members, but one body. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Why? It is written. It is written. It is written. The devil ran from Jesus. Because it was written, Matthew 21, 13 says this, I know that prayer has become lost in the church. Over the years, we've had corporate prayer almost from the conception of this church. It is amazing to me how many preachers don't know how to pray. I can't tell you how many ministers have come and gone in our congregation and they don't know how to pray. I would watch them sit and be silent or just mumble something and they did not know how to pray. Preachers should lead the charge in how to pray. Why is this church unusual on Saturday mornings of the first of every month? We'll have 150, 250 people in this building. Why is that happening? Because it is written, my house shall, not maybe, not I hope so, not if it turns out right, my house shall be called a house of Prayer, what is that? That means uh, that in this nation, not in Africa, not in Nigeria, not in India, not in Botswana, but in this nation also, uh, my house uh, shall be called uh, a house of prayer. We're not going to dwindle down. Uh, It's going to get greater and stronger until our prayer meetings look like a Sunday afternoon. You can't kill prayer. It's the language of the believer. It is how God fellowships with his people. Are we going to grow? Or is this a temporary, strange phenomenon? Galatians 4, 27 says, It is written. Rejoice, thou barren, that bearest not, and shout for joy, for the desolate will have many more children than she which had a husband. We're going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Why? Because we're not here to build a personal kingdom. We are here to lift up the name of Jesus. I have people ask the pastor, you know, are you concerned about the national exposure and the international exposure and and the building and all of that? Not at all, because I'm not building my kingdom. We're building the kingdom of the Lord. So that means that if we're just totally consumed with building the kingdom of God, then everything would just get better and better and better. For of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Hear me say it, the Lord, I'm getting ready to release signs, wonders, and miracles. Not just in the body of Christ, but it's going to be to bring the lost in. For they have stood and said, it is fake, there is no God. But the Lord said, I'm going to do things that are so astounding that they will fall to their knees and say, surely only the Lord could have done this because of the prayers of the saints, but also because it is is written. (laughs) 
Matthew 16, 17 through 18. This is what he writes. These signs shall follow them. It could be that we have not operated in the signs and wonders and the miracles because we've had the equation backwards. We have chased signs, chased wonders, chased miracles. You can't hardly put anybody in a building. We're an exception. You can have a prophetic conference that'll fill the building up. But I could bring you three or four men that can preach the pain off the walls under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And people don't want to come after that. They want the exceptional, the unusual, titillating. They're after the signs and wonders and the miracles. But the Bible doesn't say, and you shall chase after signs, wonders, and miracles. He said, no, these signs shall follow. If you chase after God, signs and wonders will follow you. In my name, they shall cast out devils. <clears throat> That's almost an extinct practice in the body of Christ. The Baptists don't cast out demons. The Methodists don't cast out demons. Say, now, don't be picking on them. The Charismatics don't cast out demons either. And a lot of Pentecostals don't. So I'm putting them all in the same basket. It takes authority to cast out demons. Hallelujah. You cannot cast out demons if there is any area in your life that any spirit has authority in. Because it negates your authority. If there is a demon in your soul realm, then you will not have authority to cast out other demons. This is why your position in God must be secure. That when you come after demon spirits, that you have the authority. That the scripture says the seven sons of a high priest raised in church had no clue about the gospel. Saw somebody demon possessed and said, in the name of Jesus, we command you to leave. Demon looked at him and said, I know Paul and I know Jesus, but I don't have a clue who you are. And then he said, get him, boys. And the Bible said they stripped their clothes off and wounded them and the guys ran away naked. There are dimensions that the church has been afraid to touch. I have more anointing in me right now than any demon has in this building. <clears throat> so I command every demon spirit, every harassing spirit, every spirit of infirmity that's in this building, in the name of the Lord, I command you to march out of this building in the name of Jesus, for this is the house of the Lord, and these are the saints of God, and you have no divine right, you have no legal right, in the name of the Lord, let their kids go right now, you foul spirit, every homosexual demon on your children, I rebuke in the name of Jesus, and I command you, let them go in the name of the Lord. Release them in Jesus' name. These are things that are beginning to happen. How do we know that we're going to see the sick healed? It's the last part of Matthew 18. The verse 18 <clears throat> says, they shall lay hands on the sick. And if everything lines up, they might have a miracle. That's not what it said. It is written, they shall 
They shall. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. They shall be healed in the name of Jesus. We are invading the powers and the dimension of the enemy today uh, that this platform is anointed uh, under the Holy Ghost. Uh, but I'm releasing the ability to heal on you in the name of Jesus. And as you march into family reunions, uh, as you go into your jobs, uh, as you go into your workplace, uh, as you go into your schools uh, and your colleges, uh, today may there be released an apostolic anointing of upon you uh, to lay hands on the sick uh, with boldness uh, and to see them healed uh, in the name of Jesus. This is going to happen. It doesn't matter if the devil tries to stop it. You can guard the tomb all you want. You put the guard out too late. Should have done it back in Isaiah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Should have been done it early on in Matthew. Destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. Hallelujah. I am resurrection. And life. What was he doing? He was releasing the word of the Lord. That even though it looked like it was over. And he has been tortured to death. And violated and torn up. And laying in a tomb. Desolate, forsaken and rejected. Yet while they guarded that tomb in the natural. The word. The word. Hallelujah. Was standing at the entrance of the tomb. What are you waiting for word? I got another 20 hours. I got down, down to 15. Then 10. And then the word saw that when it hit the third day. He declared it. It's written, and he spoke it, and all of a sudden inside of the tomb, wounds begin to heal. Then the Bible says the glory of the latter house shall be greater than that of the former. How do I know we win? It is written. How do I know you're going to be triumphant? It is written. How do I know you're going to have the wealth of the wicked? It is written. The sixth chapter of Daniel, because he was a godly man and a praying man, the governors were jealous of his position where he stood in relationship with King Darius. So they came to the king and they said, you need to make a decree for the next period of time no man can worship anybody or give honor but to the king. I believe 30 days. And the king signed it. Then they came back and said, now, we just, the Bible says this, that when Daniel knew it was signed, he went back to his house, prayed towards, I believe, Jerusalem, and begin to release worship with full knowledge of what had just been passed in law. And when they came back to the king, they said, we found him violating what you wrote in decree. And they said this, the law of the Mede and the Persians cannot be changed. I think King James says it cannot be altered. You have to put him in the lion's den. This natural law could not be changed. So Darius, with great remorse, drops Daniel in that pit with these <clears throat> man-eating lions 
What does God do? <clears throat> he can't change what man wrote. So he just makes it so it won't work. Because he looked <clears throat> at the angels and they said, yeah, you hand me some of that water. <clears throat> Thank you. Takes an army. I can be funny, believe it or not. <clears throat> and she says, what are we going to do? The Lord says, <clears throat> can't change the law. So why don't you just go down there and fix it? The Bible said when King Darius came early in the morning, because he's going to sleep all night, Rolls away the stone and says, Oh, Daniel, is thy God whom thou servest able to deliver you? Daniel said, Oh, king, my God sent an angel and stopped the mouth of the lions. <clears throat> this is what I felt like the Holy Ghost wanted me to make this point with this story. There have been laws passed in the earth and in this nation that we can't change them. They're in effect. But just because they're in effect doesn't mean they will have success against us. That God will put into the equation a divine insert that what should have worked and what should have happened didn't happen. And then, hallelujah, this is what I like. God takes the same law that was meant to extinguish his servant and puts it back on the head of those that wrote it. And the same law that was meant to kill Daniel killed them. Because the king put them in the prison and the lions destroyed them by the power and the obedience of the Holy Ghost. I tell you by the word of the Lord uh, that all of this rhetoric and all of this stuff, just because man writes it doesn't mean it supersedes the word of the Lord. It is written, my people who are called by my name, uh, when they pray, uh, I will hear from heaven uh, and I will open up the heavens upon them. Uh, we are coming into the greatest release of the glory and of the majesty of God uh, that we have ever seen uh, in this hour. There is resurrection anointing uh, in the name of the Lord. Uh, I break every spirit uh, that rules in this city in the name of the Lord uh, and declare in the next 24 hours uh, that there is a release uh, of a supernatural angel of God uh, that begins to pull down the enemy's camp. Say, how do you know that will happen? Romans 16 and 20. Now, the God of peace shall crush. Word King James says bruise, but if you look it up, the original means to crush completely. Now, the God of peace, this is a very interesting, it's almost an oxymoron, because he's called the God of peace, yet he's implementing war. See, that's the problem that so many people have about God in this hour. You know what? God's just love. Everything goes. Whatever you want, just go ahead. God's love. He's for peace. Yes, he is. But the threat of war is the greatest deterrent of war. And it's the greatest preservation, preservation of peace. Now, the God of peace shall 
crushed completely. Satan, under your feet. And then he ends it with this, shortly. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's the only time I like that word, short. <clears throat> Maybe that means a short guy is going to be part of it. But what I'm telling you is that it is written for you and I. It ain't over. The God of peace shall shortly crush completely the head of the devil under your feet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. There is something supernatural getting ready to take place in the atmosphere by the power of God. I declare that million dollar checks, five million dollar checks are coming in, not just for this building, but for that which God is yet to do with regeneration Nashville. We command every spirit, every delayed demon spirit that has held up the mail, held up the blessings of God. We rebuke you in the name of the Lord. Yeah. Say, so, well, that, that's not Bible. Yes, it is. Malachi 3.10. Bring your tithes into the storehouse. <clears throat> and because it is written, I will, not if I feel like it, not if I have enough money in the bank this week in heaven. I will open, not the window, but the windows of heaven. And I'm not going to give you a drop, but he said, I'm going to pour it out. I'm going to pour it out until there is not room enough to receive what I'm going to do for you in the name of the Lord. I release a blessing of debt free on you. I release homes given to you that are the best homes in the neighborhood paid for in Jesus' name. I release retirement to you in the name of the Lord. I release the wealth of the sinner to you in the name of Jesus. I declare that it is written because you and I are tithers. God said I'm raising the windows. I'm lifting the windows in heaven. And I'm pouring, I'm pouring, I'm pouring out on you a blessing that you can't even contain it. There are things getting ready to happen in the earth that the devil cannot stop. Because the Lord said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. The word can't die. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost is guarding the word. What has been spoken and what has been written. The Holy Spirit is a sentinel that is standing over the spoken word of God. Things that you felt an unction in prayer to declare five years ago, ten years ago. Your guardian angel is standing over that declaration that when the devourer has come in to try to kill your son and your daughter, he can't because the word of God, it is written, train a child in the ways that he should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. There has been a misinterpretation and has brought a cynicism to many people that they think that if I raise my child in church, they'll never backslide. That's not what it's saying. It's saying this. When you raised your child in church, and you train them in the house of God, and they stray, and they're in the pit, and they're sitting on the bar stool, and they're in the midst of great sin. They can't enjoy it 
because there's an inherent residence of the word of the Lord that brings conviction. And even though for a moment they enjoy it, when they go to bed at night, uh, there's this little nagging voice uh, that says, I need to go home. Uh, I ain't liking this. Uh, I know I'm not going to make it to heaven if I keep living like this. Uh, and one day, hallelujah, they come to themselves. Why? Because it is written, train a child in the ways that they should go. Uh, and when they're old, uh, they will not depart from it. And means uh, there's a whole bunch of people getting ready to come home uh, that were raised in church, uh, baptized in the Holy Ghost, uh, and we're declaring, hell, let them go. Uh, in the name of the Lord, uh, you demon spirits of hell, uh, you let our children go uh, in the name of the Lord, uh, and they're coming home. Uh, they're coming home. Uh, coming home. Why? It is written. I won't hold you too much longer, but I have a couple more points that I need to make. I actually was going to preach this message last Sunday, and God changed my mind, but it's been burning in my spirit. There is this feeling that almost of helplessness that's gotten a hold of the Christians in this hour, that there's nothing we can do about it. The situation of our nation. Listen, what, what we have seen happen has only happened in like the last three years. And, and I, I, I need to address this because I'm, I get emails and that, you know, self-appointed prophet went on a rant against the LBG QT. Is that, is that, is that how you say that? No? What, how you say it? Huh? No, no, I shouldn't. Why would I be asking you? You don't know it. <laughs> yeah, what she said. <laughs> this church, and I'm going to say this to that community, we are not your enemy. And in eternity you will find out we were your greatest friend. Because in every segment, there is always a radical core. There's the skint heads with the white people, Ku Klux Klan. There's a radical group in the black movement, you know, Black Panthers and, and all of that. There is in the Muslim group, not all Muslims want to go out and we just talked to a Muslim this week and they talked about we just need to have peace. And so you cannot judge an entire segment of people by a few. <clears throat> and so the radical voices for the gay community don't represent all of those people because most of them are kind, hardworking, talented, gifted, compassionate people. But I have to say it because <clears throat> I believe in the Bible. <clears throat> if we are wrong, then everybody's fine. In eternity. If we're right, there's a whole bunch of people in trouble. So the reason that I preach against the gay lifestyle is Romans chapter 9 says, and men who practice homosexuality will not inherit the kingdom of God in Romans 1. And so I'm not targeting anybody. I'm just quoting the book. If the book is real, there is a hell and there is a heaven. And you can't get into heaven by violating the principles of the Lord. Now, this just doesn't include the gay community. It includes 
the unforgiving, judgmental hypocrites that sit in the house of God, the adulterers, anybody. The word of the Lord is a pure book. And so please don't ever think that this is released out of hatred. I'm on your side. My son was gay and God delivered him. We are your hope because I'm telling you that there is power in this building to set you free by the power of the Lord. <clears throat> if we can become more focused on the gospel instead of fighting a natural battle and trying to enact vengeance on these people that we feel like is destroying our country. God is going to take care of you and say, well, pastor, how do we know that? Romans 12, 19. It is written, vengeance is mine. Vengeance means to protect and to defend one person from another. To punish or to vindicate one's rights or to do one justice. It is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. 